who was interested in the functioning of the brain. Uh, and he invented a field called experimental epistemology. Now, let me explain what that means. Epistemology, as a theory of knowledge, was primarily a philosophical activity, that it was considered a part of philosophy. And that meant that the method of investigation was reflective. You just think about how you think, and you think about how other people think. And it, so it was a speculative activity. McCulloch noted that thought is the result of the activity of the human brain. So he said, let's study neurophysiology. Let's study how the brain works. And that should tell us something about the nature of knowledge, the limits of knowledge, uh, what is possible uh, in the area of knowledge. So he wrote an article in 1943 with uh, Walter Pitts called A Logical Calculus of the Ideas Eminent in Nervous Activity. Now let me explain what that title said. Um, you have a network of neurons. Do you all know what a neuron looks like? This is called the cell body, an axon, and then you've got lots of dendrites. Many, many thousands of dendrites. And these meet up with another neuron. And this is called the synapse right here. And depending on how many synapses impact on another neuron, the neuron either fires or it doesn't fire. So these synapses can be either stimulating or inhibiting. And memory occurs at the synapse. All right. That is, you have a chemical change here, which either facilitates or inhibits the stimulation of the neuron. So if you were to open up my head, you wouldn't see a room. So when I look out here, I see a room with people. It's very light. And you might think that inside my head, there's also a room with people in it. But in fact, there's not. It's dark in there. OK? There's no room. There's no people. There's no sound. They're just bips. All right? So each one of these neurons either fires or doesn't fire. It's a frequency modulated device. These are all supposed to be not amplitude, but frequency modulated device. So if you listen to it by sticking in a, an electrode here, bip, 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 And those bips somehow produce an image of a room. They allow you to interpret language. They allow you to construct a three-dimensional world and to have thoughts about that world. But that's what's going on inside your brain. And we'll go through a series of experiments uh, to help you understand the limitations and the possibilities of the knowing apparatus. But that was McCulloch's interest. Okay? And that idea was shared by people like Wiener, who designed a radar-guided anti-aircraft gun, uh, which, was, which sensed the trajectory of an airplane, uh, extrapolated the future position of the airplane, aimed the gun, and fired the gun, uh, which was one of the projects during World War II. It's sometimes called the duck hunter problem. As a result of Wiener's investigations in creating perceiving and control systems, uh, information processing and decision-making systems, he made the distinction between the first and second industrial revolutions. That is, he distinguished the agricultural revolution, where you go from hunting and gathering to settled agriculture, then an industrial revolution, where you use machinery like steam power and electric power to substitute for human muscle capability. And then the second industrial revolution was when you use machinery to substitute for human intellectual capability, calculating machines, computers, etc. That idea was picked up by Daniel Bell 
later when he talked about a post-industrial society. And he says you can measure and identify these different societies by saying if 50% of the people are engaged in agriculture, it's an agricultural society. If 50% or more are engaged in industry and manufacturing, it's an industrial society. And if 50% or more are engaged in information processing and services, it's a post-industrial society. That idea was further interpreted by Alvin Toffler when he wrote a book called The Third Way, which was, again, agriculture, industry, and information processing. But that idea was initially Wiener's idea that was expressed in his book, Cybernetics. And I assume most of you know that Alan Turing and John von Neumann made the contributions that are largely interpreted as the foundation of computer science. Okay, I've described to you uh, the article by McCulloch and Pitts, A Logical Calculus of the Ideas Eminent in Nervous Activity. Let me just finish that by saying that if you have a network of neurons and they zap each other, do their thing, and the result is something we experience as an idea, that's a phenomenon in nature. That's a phenomenon we would like to have a theory of. And ideally, we would have a formal, axiomatic, mathematical, deductive theory. Okay, that's what he means by logical calculus. Okay, a logical calculus of the ideas eminent in nervous activity. That article was published in 1943. Uh, so that was one of the uh, articles that, in a sense, defined this new field of study. Another was an article by Wiener, Rosenbluth, and Bigelow. Rosenbluth was a Mexican um, neurophysiologist. Wiener was a mathematician and engineer, and Bigelow was also an engineer. And their title, Behavior, Purpose, and Teleology, uh, is an explanation of their thinking. So let's say you observe behavior, and you attribute purpose to it. That is, that is your interpretation of behavior. This behavior is purposeful. Then you want to explain the purposeful behavior. Well, teleology is an explanation of goal-directed <coughs> behavior. But now you have a problem, because scientists don't believe in behavior that is caused by a future state. If you go back to Aristotle, he formulated several causes. The, the final cause, which is the future causing the present, the efficient cause, the material cause, the formal cause. So he had several causes. Nowadays, we only have one cause, the efficient cause. We only believe that the past causes the present and the present causes the future. So if you only believe in the efficient cause, A causes B causes C causes D, how do you explain goal-directed behavior? That was the problem that Wiener dealt with. Say, so we observe behavior which looks purposeful. If you ask a human why they do something, they say, well, I did this in order to do that. So they explain things in goal-directed manner but we don't believe in anything other than an efficient cause. Scientists don't. So that was the task of cybernetics, and basically the way they solved the problem is not too surprising. They said that in the mind, you have a model. So you, and the model describes the way the world works. And you can reinterpret that model to construct an image of how the world ought to be. So you have a model of how the world is, a model of how the world ought to be, some connection between the two, and then you act so as to move the world as it is in the direction of the world that you would like to see. But all of that exists in the present. It's just symbolic activity within the brain. That explanation didn't exist in the 1940s. That's the explanation that cyberneticians created during this period of the early 1950s, based on previous work. OK, so in the late 1940s, three books were published. I've mentioned 
Wiener's book, Cybernetics, Control and Communication, Animal and Machine. Von Neumann and Morgan Stern uh, wrote their book, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. And Shannon and Weaver uh, published their book, The Mathematical Theory of Communication. Those three books form the foundation of early cybernetics. Now let me just say a little bit about them. You're probably familiar with the Shannon and Weaver diagram, Shannon's diagram, where you have input, output, feedback, and some noise that comes in. This is a very well-known diagram. In the idea of cybernetics, you have an organism and an environment. And these interact. There's your circular causality. Here's some more circular causality. Game theory is very, very similar. It says you have player A and player B. See the similarity? Okay, so the underlying idea is very, very similar in game theory and cybernetics and in communication theory. But all of them involve circularity. <clears throat> also in the 1950s, the early 1950s, the first commercial computers became available. Uh, let me just say something else. The guys that wrote the first articles on cybernetics were building their own equipment. In other words, if you wanted a computer, you built it on your kitchen table. <laughs> uh, Ross Ashby did this. It led to conflicts on the home front. Uh, they didn't have computers in the 1940s except what were constructed. Now, there were the big computers uh, in um, Britain that were used to decode the Enigma messages. This was not well known for a long time, but they've made a series of movies about it now. Uh, the British were decoding the messages of the German high command during World War II. So you can imagine if you have a game that's a, a world war and one side can read the messages of the other side, uh, who's going to win? Uh, it was an extraordinary advantage which led to the National Security Agency, the budget for the CIA, uh, etc. Also, something that was happening in the 50s was uh, this notion of a Manchurian candidate. There was a film called The Manchurian Candidate. Uh, some soldiers came back from Korea and they had been brainwashed and there was fears that you could turn a person into a robot and cause them to assassinate somebody. Uh, and so there were experiments funded by the CIA. Some of the money was channeled through the Macy Foundation conferences uh, called MK Ultra, And this was uh, mind control. And out of this came LSD, which was a very popular uh, drug during the 1960s. But the people who initially did the experiments with LSD were funded by the government because of the government's interest in mind control activities. So once again, there's this interaction between, say, uh, government and research, uh, m understanding the mind, etc. Also, the early checkers plane programs uh, were invented during the 1950s. Let me just say a little bit about of these programs. Uh, it helps to I'm limited by my ability to present alternatives on the board. But imagine a treat structure where you have a set of choices and your opponent has a set of choices. If you want the machine to learn, the way that it was conceived was just let it 
try everything. And every time 